But once again, it's wonderful to have all of you here tonight. This is a wonderful evening, and we're looking forward uh, later on. We're going to talk about the specifics of how well this event has actually gone and what a boon it will be to California State University Stanislaus. We are in the process of really preparing for you what I think will be an exciting evening. Wonderful food. They've assured me that this is going to be the greatest meal on the history of the campus. <laughs> We're now setting a lot of historical things. Biggest fundraiser, best food of all time. Uh, I think President Shervani said he will sing a Sinatra tune better than Frank. <laughs> I will take bids on that. I think for enough money, he might even do that. So uh, it, it's just, it's been great. It's you know, I, I look back at, at, you know, as we talked about this as a board, when we said this is what we're going to do, we know it's going to be interesting, there's going to be people on all sides, but it's obviously well beyond what we would have expected. But you know what? You sure can't beat the advertising we got. <laughs> all right? Thank you. Thank you so much. So at this time, I would like to welcome Governor of Alaska, Sarah Palin. Ladies and gentlemen, here she comes. I'd also like to introduce President Ham Shervani of California State University, Stanislaus. Yes, folks, this is really happening. We really made it here. And I would be remiss if I didn't introduce the governor's lovely daughter, Willow, who made the trip with her. So let's get rolling. I'd like to bring up Marie Brichetto to lead us in a Pledge of Allegiance. You guys to hold the mic or do you want to hold the mic? Are you guys ready? Ready. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And while we're rolling, let's bring Pastor Ken Van Vliet up to open the evening with an invocation. Pastor Ken from Monte Vista Chapel, right down the street. Take it away. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, as we gather together this evening to celebrate the 50th anniversary of California State University Stanislaus, we are grateful for the freedoms afforded to us that both allow and encourage the pursuit of higher education. We are humbled by the great price of that freedom, which has been paid by many who have gone before us, and we ask your protection over those who this very day so willingly serve to protect it. May we never take that freedom for granted. And Father, as we reflect upon the past accomplishments of this institution, we also look to the future, asking your blessing upon the administration, the staff, and the professors. Watch over them and guide them as they continue to play such a vital role in shaping the minds of future generations. Father, will you give them wisdom and strength to navigate these difficult and uncertain times, and will you cause them to emerge a stronger university because they have done so? I also pray for your blessing upon the students, both current as well as those who will walk through the halls in the many years to come. May their ongoing quest for greater knowledge and understanding lay a strong foundation for our future. Will you use this university not only to grow their minds, but to strengthen their character and develop virtue, so that which has been learned will be used not only for personal advancement, 
but for the betterment of our community, our nation, and our world. So, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to celebrate and to honor this university. Bless those who have worked so hard to make this event possible. Thank you for our guest speaker, Governor Palin, and we ask a special blessing upon her tonight. And finally, Father, we pray that everything that is said and done this evening be pleasing in your sight. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. And I think we're going to bring the president to the podium. We're going to bring our wonderful leader and my good friend, Ham Shervani, to the front to really kick this thing off officially. Mr. Swanson has already kicked this wonderful session uh, evening uh, uh, already, and he has done a, such a fabulous job. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this wonderful 50th anniversary gala. I wanted to uh, first thank all the sponsors and others who, have, who are in attendance tonight. You are the one who make tonight possible. We truly appreciate everything you've done for our university. We truly appreciate all your commitment and dedication. And we are really honored to have you all here. Thank you for everything you've done to make this wonderful event possible. Now, I would like to recognize now some uh, of our elected officials here that uh, uh, they are with us today. Uh, first, my dear friend, uh, Senator Jeff Denham, that <laughs> of course, I like to call him our Congressman Jeff Denham. <laughs> then of course, Stanis uh, Stanislaus County's supervisor and former Senator Dick Monty. Dick. And again, another one of my friends, Stanis Kali Supervisor Vito Chiesa. That's right there. Last, Modesto City Council member, Kristen Olson, pretty soon, Assemblywoman Kristen Olson. <laughs> Finally, uh, I'd like to thank wonderful members of our foundation board, which have done such a great job. I'm indebted to them. I'm grateful to them. Without California State University Stanislaus Foundation, we wouldn't have been where we are. We wouldn't have been where we are today. We are, we are a completely different university. We have transformed through levels and levels higher than we have been only because of the help and support of the California State University Stanislaus Foundation members. Would they please rise and be recognized? Please, Foundation Board members. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to introduce three uh, of my vice presidents, which are here are uh, starting with our uh, provost and vice president for uh, academic affairs, Dr. Jim Strong and his wife, Jane. Jim. And our great vice president for business and finance, uh, and that is Ross Jambaluka and Pat Jambaluka. And, and of course, our vice president for advancement, which is responsible for this event, vice president uh, Susanna geisch Bourier and Jeff Bourier. So we're going to leave you for a minute, enjoy your dinner, and uh, we're going to come back. Please, thank you.
At this time, I want to bring up our president, Dr. Shervani, a good friend, a strong leader, and a man we appreciate. A man whose board recently has voted or has passed a unanimous resolution in support of him and his work at this university. He works tirelessly, and he was courageous enough to stand behind us the whole way as we worked and got this thing done so that we could be here tonight for our students and our faculty and our staff and this university in total. Thank you again, and Dr. Shmani, please come up. Thank you so much, Matt, for this wonderful introduction. Well, are you excited? Yeah. I didn't hear you. Yeah. Great. Now, this is the time, this is the time and the moment we've all been waiting for. Let's give a warm and enthusiastic welcome to the Honorable Sarah Palin. I'm not finished yet. Sit down, please. <laughs> this is academic introduction. Don't forget, you're in a university. <laughs> you can't get a college professor off the podium that easy. <laughs> it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Our distinguished speaker is the most recognizable woman in the world today. She is the most elegant stateswoman, and according to Time magazine, one of the top 100 most influential people in the world. She became the youngest governor to serve the state of Alaska. She became the very first female vice presidential nominee on the Republican ticket. A loving and dedicated mother of five children. She represents the American spirit, strong conviction, commitment to her core values, perseverance and hard work in the face of obstacles and obscenity, an adversary. Governor Palin is a great American. An accomplished political leader a courageous public servant who is passionate in her love for preserving the constitutional right and freedom in America. I believe Sarah Palin is an American icon. Please join me in giving a Stanislaus welcome to Governor Sarah Palin. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Oh, I so appreciate that warm introduction and Tell you what, you are a bold man. You are a bold man. Um, I am so honored to get to be here. And before we get started, let me just get through some logistics really quickly. First, um, I've got my water. Do I have my straws? I want my straws. <laughs> and I want them bent, please. Thank you. At least that's what I read in some of the lamestream media outlets is that uh, I was demanding straws or some ridiculous thing. So I, I'm just so glad that, oh, we got some of those con contractual demands out of the way and finally settled. I think, though, that my Speaker's Bureau 
Washington Speakers Bureau, I think that this is one of the toughest contracts I think that they ever ended up getting to sign. Um, they found that to be one tough event to sort out because it seemed to them that they were negotiating with the entire state of California. <laughs> and here, you know, the rest of us looking in and, and kind of following what was going on with some of the shenanigans that looked like, ah, Jerry Brown and friends, come on, this is California. Do you not have anything else to do? <laughs> Goodness gracious. Priorities. And then, though, you know, I was expecting uh, quite a few protests. Protesters, I, I thought that, you know, I'd, I'd get a little bit of the Ann Coulterism. Uh, and, and I thought, hey, that would be cool. I love Ann Coulter. And, you know, more, more power to her as she goes on college campuses and she talks about America and American values and principles and what it means to be an American. And, and I expected a little bit of, of that, but it's been nothing but absolute loveliness here in in this part of California, and I so appreciate the hospitality. And again, I do appreciate your boldness. Thank you for the invitation. In spite of some of the hoopla leading up to this dinner, I am, as I say, extremely delighted to get to be here and be back in beautiful California, especially Turlock. And it's gorgeous. And uh, relating to so many of you who are the family farmers in this part of the country, um, I have great respect for you. In fact, kind of in that same realm, Todd and I, we have a family commercial fishing business, and, and that too is a business that you want to pass on generation to generation. And Todd, today, he couldn't be with me because he headed over to our fishing grounds this morning in Bristol Bay, and that's where he is. But getting to speak with many of you today and hearing about your um, entrepreneurial spirit and, and your work ethic as, as you are raising your children to uh, help take over some of the family farming business. It's very impressive, and I've learned much about your business even in this day, and I'll never call an almond an almond again. I will call it an amen. Yes? But that relationship then and that connection with that family farming business in our own commercial fishing business that uh, has really made a wonderful connection. And it's good to be here in the home of the Warriors. I was raised a warrior too. Wasilla Warriors is our mascot, so I feel that connection. And I was telling Willow about that and happy that my daughter Willow could get to be with me. And yes, my entourage is with me today. The one, the Willow. That's, that's, that's what I got. So it's going to be funny as more of this contract business is being brought to courts and they're doing whatever they're doing as, as they look at what the demands were to put this event together. I think they're going to be really surprised that they're not really being a there there. There's not a whole lot uh, of controversy, I think, involved in this. And I'm just so happy that uh, you uh, stuck with this program, you stuck with this event, and you didn't cancel on me. I appreciate it very much, you guys. I do. It's evident that there is something special here, there is something different, and, and really I think is made manifest in an event like this. I so appreciate it. Uh, the Golden State always being nice to be here and, and always um, feeling such a connection here, a special place in my heart is California, I, because this is Reagan country. And yeah. And perhaps it was destiny that the man who went to California's Eureka College would become so woven within and interlinked to the Golden State. And it was here that, he, of course, Reagan became famous as an actor and then distinguished himself as such a good governor and then launched his bid for president and then, of course, found his final resting place underneath the warm blue California sky. And I thought of Reagan as I was preparing for this evening because, of course, speaking at a California university, as I say, I figured that I'd probably have a welcoming committee of a lot of uh, perhaps angry demonstrating protesters. Couldn't help but remember that as governor of California, Reagan too, he had his share of confrontations with his state, the college protesters from here. And remember back then, they'd call him a fascist. They called him an idiot. Uh, but the Gipper, he would return the compliment. And he was never one to shy away from confrontation, but he would return the compliment I read one quote from him, and speaking about these protesters, he said, um, well, they look like Tarzan, they walk like Jane, and they smell like cheetah. So <laughs> maybe not a lot has changed in the last 40 years. Reagan liked to crack a joke or two about the college protests, essentially because he recognized what they were protesting was 
differing views and um, not wanting to maybe apply freedom of speech to those with whom they perhaps would be disagreeing. But uh, he never failed to stress the importance of the education, though, that his students in the state, that the students were receiving. And I want to talk about that tonight. And again, it being such an honor to be here with this organization associated with one of the most prestigious university systems in the nation and, and one of the largest in the world, congratulations on your success and helping prepare our next leaders, the warriors that will be leading this nation. Congratulations on your success. <laughs> and such a gorgeous campus. Gorgeous. I've certainly been thinking a lot about this topic, though, this teaching of the next generation. I want to talk about our civic education and how it touches upon the ideals of our youth and the ideals of our country. And the topic came up for me some weeks ago when I was presenting a speech in Denver, and I had the privilege following the speech of participating in a Q&A panel with two uh, well-respected radio talk show hosts, Hugh Hewitt and Dennis Prager, both very bold individuals, and I have a lot of respect for both of them, so I was pleased to get to participate. One question asked by the moderator, if you could name a single threat to our society, one above all others, what would it be? And Dennis Prager was the first to answer this question. Now, he could have chosen any number of important life or death threats to our country and our culture. He could have said, greatest threat is our exploding national debt and the record-setting deficits because this is where we're going. Is we're putting our country on a path towards insolvency, and, and that's immoral. It's unethical. It's wrong. It's a generational theft because we're stealing opportunity from our children as we incur these great debts. And we will be an insolvent country if we continue down this road. So he could have said that um, and reminded people that with this debt, we're less safe and we are less free. Or he could have said that the growing threat to our energy security is the number one threat because Washington, and it seems our president, doesn't understand the inherent link between domestic energy production and our own prosperity or energy and our freedom, energy, and our security. There seems to be that missing link there in Washington, not understanding. Or he could have said the international terrorism's attempt to destroy us, both at home and abroad, or to destroy our allies, an, a consistent, strong ally like Israel, a threat to that country, could have mentioned that. But instead, Prager looked beyond these immediate threats, and he focused on something that would affect us all forevermore, in a longer term sense, his biggest fear, he said, is that we're not passing on what it means to be an American to this new generation. And I agreed with his concerns, but I offered a caveat when it was my turn to respond. I had to ask then, recognizing that, yeah, we're not doing as well as we could, passing on what it means to be an American to the next generation. But then how could it be if we're not teaching the next generation what it means to be free and how important it is to be free, how then can it be that we have America's finest with our thousands and thousands of young men and women who are choosing as patriots, my own teenage son being one of them, having chosen, though never having tasted anything but freedom, to join our United States military, just kind of inherently knowing how important it is to fight for freedom and to protect our Constitution, to know that America is worth defending, they enlist then voluntarily in our U.S. military to defend freedom, and that is so encouraging. So how could it be, it can't be possible that we are losing this next generation, not when you see that proof of that acknowledgement of how important an American is and living that American ideal is when you see who is enlisting in our military. Perhaps these kids, and so many of them are just kids, perhaps they not being able to articulate what it is that instills in them this inherent belief that they need to protect the blessings of liberty, but they get it, and thank God they get it, and they're willing to lay down their lives for us and lay it all on the line to sacrifice, to de defend and, and serve something greater than self, to defend the American idea of liberty. Thank God for these kids. But even considering the example of young people like our service women and our service men, Prager is right. Uh, Perhaps it is that we are not properly educating our youth in the exceptional nature of America and our liberty. It's worrisome because, because this belief in American exceptionalism 
is something that every new generation has to make its own if we expect our republic and our liberties to be secure and to live on. For America to survive, we've got to pass this on to that next generation. And to understand that, we have to go back to the beginning of our republic and to the heart of what it means to be an American. And I do wish that we had a lot of time tonight to talk about a lot of examples that we could give of, of things we're doing right, but things that we could be doing better. We, we don't have much time, but I, I want to hit on this. That you see, most countries are the result of accidents of history, either wars of conquest or peace treaties, things like that. But America is different. We're not the product of historical accident, but of design. We're the only country in history that was founded on an ideal, and that ideal is liberty. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among those, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the genius of our founding fathers is that they took that, they took what the Declaration of Independence calls the laws of nature and of nature's God, and those laws that as the Apostle Paul says, are written on our hearts. And these providential forefathers of ours, they designed a constitution that enshrined them and allowed people to live within them. And it's an awesome gift given to us in this Declaration of Independence, which really was a declaration of responsibility too, and in our constitution, including the Bill of Rights. There's an Anecdote about Margaret Thatcher, who's a big fan of America. She was a good friend of Ronald Reagan's, remember, and she agreed with this enshrinement of God-given liberty. It said that during a meeting about the British Conservative Party's best course of action to take during an economic crisis in the 70s, that she was arguing with some so-called political pragmatist who was arguing in favor of a third way between free market capitalism and socialism. And before he was even finished, Margaret Thatcher reached into her purse and pulled out a copy of Hayek's The Constitution of Liberty, and she slapped it on the table, and she says, this is what we believe in, this Constitution of Liberty. And in that same way, every American should and could, whenever she or he is challenged to define what America really stands for, that American should be able to pull out a copy of our very own Constitution of Liberty and say, this is what we stand for. This is what makes us different. It's the very thing that all of our politicians and our men and women in uniform, it, it is what they swear to uphold and to defend. And it's the glue that holds us together as Americans as we strive for a more perfect union. But something seems to be missing, especially it seems like in this last year or two, something's missing in this more enlightened day. I guess some people want to consider this day, but here's the crux of the issue. It's what Dennis Prager was trying to get at. The Constitution has given us an amazingly valuable governing principle and, and institution that this Constitution provides us with checks and balances and limited government with enumerated powers and an independent judiciary and states' rights as protected under the Tenth Amendment. But those principles that are enshrined are still the best possible protection against tyranny. They're not enough in and of themselves to assure the survival and the success of liberty or the survival of our country. There have been other countries that have sometimes managed to kind of live by essentially the same laws of nature that America has that we enshrined in our founding documents. Countries have tried to copy our constitution and our institutions, but if you think about it, not all of them are still free today, but it is human nature to want to be free. The people living in these countries, they so want to be free. Countries that have tried to uh, copy what it is that America does, but, but they haven't been successful. In all countries, even in the worst tyrannies, you'll find people courageous enough to stand up for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it is in this striving that helped bring down the Berlin Wall, remember, and it, it made one brave man stare down a column of tanks near Tiananmen Square, and it brought thousands of people onto the streets of Tehran to defy the unelected dictatorship of their country. What a contrast, by the way, between the ultimate sacrifice made 
about a year ago, about a year ago, made by the beautiful young Iranian woman, Nadia Soltan. She was shot through the heart and bleeding to death on the streets of Tehran while demonstrating for her freedom and for women's rights, for equal rights. What a contrast between her and the students, or the political operatives anyway, maybe not students necessarily, here, who has spent their valuable, precious time diving through dumpsters before this event in order to silence someone with whom they prejudicially thought that maybe they would disagree with. What a waste of resource. Now, a suggestion for those dumpster divers. Instead of trying to tell people to sit down and shut up, maybe you tell, spend some time telling people like our president to finally stand up and speak out for those like Nadia, her, as she sought her freedom. She was willing to die for it and to speak about perhaps the brutal, brutal suppression of Iran's green movement and may it become a green revolution. Uh, students and political operatives who have been part of the controversy of this event tonight, goodness gracious, you have a chance to hold America's leadership to the high ideals of which this country was founded. Please take that opportunity. It really is much more worthy and important than rummaging through garbage bins to reveal to the world perhaps someone's demand for bendy straws. <laughs> Speaking to a couple of new friends that I made on this day, who have come from Iran, as a matter of fact. Uh, they have reminded me of America's opportunity to export our democracy in such a good way. Mm, that is so encouraging. It's so inspiring to me to keep up the good fight. But, okay, back to the point, though, as inspiring as these revolutions are, that these aforementioned um, revolutions, uh, and as hopeful as the efforts at emulating our successful constitution may be, in the end, we can learn as much, though, from the failed attempts at copying our institutions as from the successful ones. And again, I wish that we had more time. Uh, one way to get more examples of some of these failed revolutions and what we can learn from them so that we do not repeat the mistakes of other countries in the past is, uh, I'll, I'll do a little advertisement here. If you watch on Fridays, Founders Fridays, Glenn Beck, he highlights much, in fact, Founders Fridays. This is my reminder. Yes, the poor man's version of the teleprompter. That's one thing you forgot. You didn't get me a teleprompter. But um, yeah, when the media hands you lemon, you make lemonade. Every speech I do, I get to do a free advertisement because I know you guys are going to pick it up back there. So Glenn Beck's Founders Fridays, he'll tell you a lot more about these failed attempts, maybe successful attempts in, with other countries even in the past. And historians agree though, for example, that uh, one example we hear much about the German Weimar Republic had the most democratic constitution in the world. Did you know that? In human history, the historians look back and say, man, th their constitution was even more democratic than our own. But that same constitution, allowed a man named Adolf Hitler to seize power because of some tweaks in the law and some misinterpretations of what the Constitution actually said. It allowed, it allowed then Adolf Hitler to seize power and plunge the world into a nightmare period of chaos and war and genocidal murder. These failures like that one show us that freedom doesn't just depend on institutional guarantees or words written on a document. It is also, and above all, a question of culture. And here's where the university system comes in. To most Americans, freedom isn't just an ideal or words written on a charter of liberty. It is a way of life for most of us. And it's in our lively public debates which give us opportunity to exercise our constitutional rights to free speech even. And it's in our free markets which give everyone with an idea and with a willingness to work hard, to really work hard, to make something of themselves in this country. And it's in our voluntary associations and our culture of most generous, voluntary, charitable giving. When we see someone having troubles, for instance, our instinctive response for most of us, it's not, well, what's the government going to do about it? No, our response is, what can I do to help? How can I jump in there and help? 
It's this love of freedom and the moral capital that's generated through these free markets and these free associations that has helped keep our great Republican experiment alive for more than 200 years now. So when we see Washington strain from those ideals and the free market uh, system that has built America into the strongest, the strongest, most generous country on earth, it, it's why we know we're on the wrong path right now and we have to turn some things around. America may be founded by laws, see, but it's sustained by a morality that's recognized by so many other countries even. As the French writer Alexis de, Co de Coqueville said, America is a great country because America is a good country. And Dennis Prager's point that night in Denver was that this uniquely American culture of freedom, it needs protecting and nurturing, and it needs to be carefully handed over from one generation to the next. And Reagan used to speak of this too. So schools, the universities need to take note of this message. I, I wish it's, it's where education does come in. President Kennedy once spoke of the survival and success of liberty. Well, there can be no survival and success of liberty without an education in freedom and the values that made this country great. Values like thrift and perseverance and responsibility and work ethic, reward for, hard, for honest hard work. And some might say that there is a contradiction here, perhaps. They'd argue that academic freedom is incompatible with our need for a civic education that instills in young people the wisdom and the patriotic grace necessary for the survival and the success of liberty. But I think that they are wrong. I think that they are dangerously wrong. The fact that we allow or should allow for a healthy and free academic debate of all ideas doesn't mean that we have to believe that all ideas are equally valid. Unfortunately, too often, that turns into just one small step away from claiming that, well, there just isn't just one right answer to the question, what is right, what is good, or just, or true, to saying that, well, there are no right answers to these questions. There's, that's where relativism comes into play, and that turns into nihilism. And then we find people saying, well, then nothing is truth. Therefore, anything goes. Just, just do it. Everything's permitted. There's no truth. If this cultural relativism is confined merely to a few individuals, the exceptions to the norm, well, that's one thing. But we have seen before what happens when whole sections of society fall into that trap. Take note of this. Uh, consider that... <clears throat> Would the brutality of communism have lasted as long as it did if there hadn't been a large group of people here in the West who were willing to essentially accommodate it for fear of daring to even condemn it? For a long time, folks, it was kind of consider considered sophisticated to take a position somewhere between freedom and communism. And it took a supposedly unsophisticated graduate from lowly Eureka College to bring communism to its knees. And he did it by simply calling an evil empire what it was, evil. There's an important lesson here for us today. A free republic can only survive if its citizens are willing and able to defend it ideologically and to stand up for its founding principles. And there's an old conservative joke. It, it, it says that an elite liberal is someone who is so broad-minded that they can't even take their own side in an argument. <laughs> I think that could apply to some of the college professors and I, I, I've met. So, but, you know... <laughs> really no joke when we have seen, hmm, even recently, American diplomats apologizing to a communist dictatorship because of one of our sister states here in the good old United States of America, Arizona, just trying to enforce an American federal law to apologize for that. Or if we get an administration... <laughs> If we get an administration that unilaterally tries to end a war on terror, not by winning it, but instead by no longer referring, it, referring to it as a war on terror, as if 
The evil terrorists will stop attacking us once we proclaim that we just won't call it terrorists or terrorism anymore. That's not how we're going to win this thing. That is as dangerously naive as the supposedly broad-minded intellectuals who defend repulsive practices like like female mutilation in some countries, simply because, well, they claim, well, that's part of their culture, so we, we don't talk about it. We'll tolerate that. That's part of their culture. That reminds me of the 19th century British general, Sir Charles Napier. He was commander-in-chief in India. Years ago, he made a controversial decision to ban the barbaric practice of suti, and that's where Indian men would burn a widow alive by putting her on a funeral platform, a pyre, with her dead husband. Uh, when Indian men protested that, hey, this ritual is just part of our culture, well, Napier answered that if they insisted on exercising that cultural right, then he'd introduce them to a British custom. And what he told them was, well, in Britain, when men burn a woman alive, we hang them. So you build your funeral platforms, and we'll build our gallows. You follow your custom, we'll follow ours. And needless to say, that terrible crime against women became scarcer and scarcer under Napier's insistence. Like him, we too, we have to have the courage of our convictions in taking a stand against evil when confronted with it, and sometimes that means calling evil by its name. For example, regardless of what some politically correct intellectuals say, a terrorist like Osama bin Laden is not a freedom fighter. He does not fight for freedom, he fights against it, and um, he, he fighting against democracy and, and all of our ancient liberties. How, how dare we want to label his, uh, him anything that has kind of a positive connotation as being a freedom fighter. It, and it's not just about calling evil evil. It's not just about being against something, but it is being for something right. It's about being unashamed to defend what is good about our culture and in our country. Not thinking that we must apologize for what America stands for, but we must honor our belief in the fundamental rights and the dignity of every innocent human being. And we must celebrate our relentless, sunny optimism. Remember, that's what Reagan was known for. That had to have come from California, that sunny optimism. <laughs> and, and that pioneering spirit that built this country, it inspired us to cross oceans and carve out a life in the wilderness and by the sweat of our brow to create and contribute and to build a better life in America. We must embrace our entrepreneurial drive to build and to produce and, and to innovate and allow America to remain the world standard bearer for excellence. And we must affirm our willingness to stand up for people across the globe who are yearning to be free. They look to us we are that beacon of hope for what it means to be free. And truly, that is nothing to apologize for. Now, we could spend a precious, valuable time trying to build some complicated, bureaucratically blessed new national civics curriculum, I'm sure, in all of, all of our schools. But to be honest, in the end, it all comes down to good old-fashioned common sense. And I know that on a lot of college campuses, that ain't a real cool thing. It's not real hip to just have some common sense. I don't know, I don't know. But uh, ask parents what, what they want in their child's education. And they're probably going to tell you that they don't care much for all this political stuff. What a parent desires for their child's education is basic. You know, they want the three R's. And they want true history taught our country, our laws, our traditions, our art, and our literature, and our heroes, and our statesmen. They want true teaching of our, our geography and, and biology, and getting to know the world in which we live in, and the beautiful creatures which we share this planet with, and within science, finding out how things work, and unraveling the mysteries of the universe, and not shying away from being able to debate differing sides of theories and ideas and a basic knowledge of right and wrong. That's what we desire in our children's education. And obviously, these things aren't exclusively the purview of universities, but 
schools and universities do play such a crucial role in educating young people about what it means to be an American. And it is up to the universities to help make sure that our liberties are secured for the next generation. And you do that by promoting those values on which our free society has been built. And sometimes, too, by opposing those that undermine it, undermine it to have the boldness, the courage, like Ham has at this university, to kind of buck the tide, not just go with the flow. As a commercial fisherman, I, I look down there at the run of fish, and I notice only dead fish go with the flow. <laughs> but someone like Ham, <laughs> not just going along to get along, but not being afraid to kind of shake it up and, and to allow that debate of, different sides of issues, that's what's valuable here on this campus. Politicians have to do their part too by ensuring the survival of the institutions on which our free society is built. One can't do one without the other. President Kennedy said, liberty without learning is always in peril and learning without liberty is always in vain. From Valley Forge to Gettysburg to Omaha Beach, the fate of America has always kind of skirted a, a precipice, but most of us, we never doubt that it's been a providential hand that has guided us and is guiding us towards a better future. Education's highest aim should be instilling in students a sense of this uniquely American predicament, of the fragility of it, as well as the greatness of this Republican experiment of ours and an awareness that the survival and the success of liberty depends on them. And I do believe that America is great because she is good and that we are a force for good in this world. Not, again, not something to apologize for, but something to be proud of. America is truly the exceptional country. And we are, in the words of Lincoln, that last best hope on earth. And if we do it right, we remain in the words of the Golden State's Ronald Reagan, this shining city on a hill where the abiding alternative to tyranny. So let us help our young people understand this. Let's teach the next generation what it means to be American. And you are so on the right track here at CSU. So God bless you. Thank you for being part of the solution. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys.